Huda, a light in every home. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya wa al-mursaleen. Nabina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallama tasliman kathira. Dear respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome to Ask Huda. My name is Haytham al-Haddad. I am standing here on behalf of our beloved Sheikh. Muhammad Salah because he has some other commitments. Uh, we will receive your calls as usual on 0020238555248 and 249. The number inshallah will be displayed in front of you in the screen. And you can send your emails to ask at huda.tv. Ask A S K at huda.tv. Jazakum Allah khaira. Go ahead and insha'Allah call us. Um, we have a few questions, in fact, from the previous episode. Uh, let me take those questions because I think they have priority over other questions. Uh, the first question we had from the previous episode by Ummu Amana from the UAE. Uh, she said, can I pay my zakah with jewelry instead of money? Also, can I pay uh, zakah to my mother-in-law? Finally, my wife has had a zakatable jewelry for the last four years and we have not paid zakah on it. What should we do? Uh, as you can see, these are a uh, few questions. The first question, can I pay my zakat with jewelry instead of money? Okay, uh, my dear respected brothers and sisters, we have to understand that once we say jewelry, what do we mean by jewelry? Jewelry can be gold, silver, and some other precious stones or some other material. The, what is the catable is what is made from gold or silver only. The other material, material uh, precious material, uh, precious stones, they are not zakatable because they are not mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Unless you uh, are uh, taking them as a matter of trade, trading commodities. Other than that, they are not uh, zakatable. So this is the first point. The second point, if we say that what is zakatable is the golden or silver jewelry, it means that this uh, substance itself is the zakatable substance, which means that the zakat that you can give is from gold and silver. So if your jewelry is gold or silver, of course you can give the zakat from gold and silver. This is the main concept. Uh, the question is, uh, can we give the zakat of jewelry from normal money or not? This is the uh, real question. And of course, as we maybe, I'm sure Sheikh uh, Muhammad Salah mentioned this number of times that from an Islamic perspective nowadays, uh, paper money is considered to be uh, gold and silver or has the same ruling as gold and silver. So this is the first part of the question. Um, the second part of the question is, uh, can I pay my zakat to my mother-in-law? Now, the brother is asking the question, and he said, can he pay the zakat to his mother-in-law? And we say, yes, generally speaking, you can pay your zakat to your mother-in-law, uh, provided that you are not benefiting from this zakat money that you are giving it to your mother-in-law. Uh, or your wife is not benefiting from uh, the zakah that has been given to her mother. So other than this, of course, you can give your zakah to your mother-in-law. Uh, 
And I think from just an ethical perspective, my dear uh, brother, you should not leave your mother-in-law uh, to a level of poverty where she needs to get zakah. Um, uh, just before I take the next question, I think there is a caller. Uh, let me take uh, this caller, Islam from Egypt. Uh, Islam, go ahead, Islam uh, from Egypt. Um, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Tafadda. Um, I have three questions. Uh, can you hear me fine? Yes, go ahead, yeah. Thank you. The first question is, is it permissible to wear the wedding band, which is called the... Is that because I heard it's a bit odd? That's number one. Sorry, the, the line was cut off a little bit. Is it permissible to? To wear the wedding band, which ah. is called Dibla. The, the, the wedding, the wedding uh, ring. Ring, yes. Yeah, okay. That's, that's, uh -huh. that's called a Dibla. That's number one. Number two, um, is it permissible for a woman to travel by herself from Egypt to America and from America to Egypt? Mm -hmm. um, number three, is the housework for a, for a wife is that obligatory which is, of course she is being thanked for and everything but is that obligatory for her or it's just something that she does out of yes like charity on the husband that's it thank you very much okay zakallah khairia islam from egypt we'll try to deal with your questions inshallah after we uh, finish the questions in hand um the second question or the third question of uh, brother abu amana from uh, UAE, he said that his wife had zakatable jewelries for the last four years, and we have not paid zakah on it. They have not paid zakah on it. What should they do? Uh, first of all, I would like to warn all my brothers and sisters. I'm uh, sure that this is a very common question. I received this question in the UK on the fatwa line frequently, and from practicing people, they say, "Oh, Sheikh." I forgot I was ignorant and I did not pay my zakah for four years, five years, ten years. We had uh, people who have not paid zakah for maybe all of their life. What shall they, those people do? This is a big mistake. This is a big mistake. It is a big sin. And no one can say that, oh, uh, I forgot. Subhanallah. You do not forget so many things, but you forget to give zakah. By, we can say that you forget to give zakah one year, two years, but four years, or some people said that they forgot to give zakah for 10 years. This is, I think this is too much. And all of you, I know, I, I'm sure that all of you, my dear respected brothers and sisters, know and aware of the ayat that talk about the importance of zakah. And the Prophet وسلم, explained this verse, this Quranic verse, in the very famous hadith reported by Abi Huraira anhu, in Sahih al Bukhari, who said, and the Prophet وسلم, said, any person who does not give the zakah, it will come at the day of resurrection, or he will come at the, at the day of the resurrection, and the gold and silver will be beaten into plates, and they will be heated in the fire of hell, and he will be branded by those beaten plates uh, on his sides, on his forehead, on his back. And he will be tortured. Listen to this, my dear respected brothers and sisters. He will be tortured and punished by this just in the day of resurrection during the accountability. Before even going to the fire of hell itself. And how long is the day of resurrection? 50,000 years. So why do we neglect giving zakah? And there are a number of statements. Uh, of course, it is not a lecture about the importance of zakah. But please, my dear respected brothers and sisters, put attention to giving zakah on time. And I would like to warn all my brothers and sisters that zakah has two rights. The right of Allah Jalla wa ala, and the right of the people. So when you withhold zakah and you do not give people the zakah, it means what? 
it means that you deprive the more devastated people in our community their rights, which is the zakah. Anyway, first of all, you need to make istighfar of Allah Jalla wa ala and tawbah. Many people neglect this and they say, oh, is there any kafara? They always think of the tangible action. They do not think of tawbah. You should, you should make tawbah and istighfar, sincere tawbah and istighfar. This is the first thing. The second thing is estimate the amount of zakah that you should have paid in the first year and the second uh, year and the third year and the fourth year. Estimate the amount of zakah that you should have paid. And listen to this. Estimate if this zakah were to be paid at that time, how much this zakah would have been increased. This is in order to be on the safe side. I strongly believe in this measure. Why, subhanAllah, in the West we see this, that if a person is uh, entitled of a certain amount of money and he was not given that whenever he is asking for that money he does not ask for that money only he's asking for that money and moreover what this money could have uh, done for him the increase this money could have uh, brought to him so i would like to appeal to you to do the same thing with the right of allah and the right of the people Okay, um, we have a phone call. Uh, go on, um, Tola. Okay, Abdul Aziz, we have Abdul Aziz from Oman. Yes, brother Abdul Aziz? Brother Abdul Aziz. Wa alaykum wa rahmatullah. I can hear you. Go on. Go ahead. Go ahead, brother. I can hear you. Wa alaykum wa rahmatullah. The line, the line was cut off. No problem. طيب. Sister Aisha, we have another caller. Sister Aisha, go ahead, please. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullah. I would like to have a question, ask a question. Yes, please. My sister has been diagnosed with a gallstone of two centimeter near her bile gut. Okay. And uh, meanwhile, as they were scanning, they also found out uh, that she was five weeks pregnant. Uh, um, sister, can you repeat the question again, please? Slowly, slowly, uh, and a little bit louder, please. Yeah. A sister has been diagnosed with gallstone, stone in the gallbladder. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Okay. A stone and in the... During the scan, they also found out she is five weeks pregnant. Mm -hmm. Now, because the gallstone is like around two centimeters, and it has to be removed, so what should be the procedure? Should they go, uh, because so this is in India, they are asking her to abort the child and go ahead with the surgery. Yeah. So can she do that because the pregnancy is five weeks? Okay. And she cannot do that uh, surgery except with the abortion of this uh, child? Uh, there is another doctor who said that uh, uh, this only on uh, uh, over the phone they consented. Uh, but uh, they can go ahead and do the surgery and because of the anesthesia, if anything happens to the child, then they can go ahead and abort. So they don't know which measure to do first, whether they should go with the surgery or they should go with the abortion first. Okay. Okay, inshallah. We'll try to answer you. Okay. Okay. Uh, we have another caller, Farhan from UAE. Yeah. Go ahead, Farhan, ya khi. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum, assalamu alaikum. Yeah, uh, this question is actually on behalf of my relative. Uh, uh, he is in Riyadh right now. He might be trying to call you. Uh, uh, we both decided to call together, whoever gets the chance. Uh, he uh, is uh, an engineer and he has been working there uh, for a few years. Uh, unfortunately, he has been out of job since last three months consistently. Now, uh, since uh, he's, uh, it's a long time now, uh, he, after trying so much uh, everywhere, he could not find a job, and now he has got a, an offer from Pakistan from a conventional bank. Mm -hmm. Now, we all know that, of course, you know, it is not permissible, um, but uh, his question was that in such circumstances when, uh, you know, he has not been getting any offers, 
uh, would it be okay to accept the offer and until that time that he gets uh, you know a halal job um, okay. and he, in this circumstances would it be acceptable or not uh, okay. we, we are very well aware of the circumstances and the consequences of this but uh, uh, is it is it is there yeah. any way clear inshallah clear Okay, Ridwan again from UAE, mashallah. We have so many callers from UAE now. Yes, go on, Ridwan. Hello? Yes, go on, I can hear you. Yeah, I, I have two questions. Uh, the first question is, uh, what is the ruling on folding pant while praying? Is it necessary to fold the pant so as to make the ankles visible? Ah, to fold, to fold your trousers? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, correct. Trousers. Yeah. yeah. And, and second question, uh, if you are passing across someone who is uh, praying in the mosque, how much distance we need to keep? As I have seen, once the Jamais were, there are many people from the front side of the mosque, when they, are, they want to go outside, they find it difficult because there are so many people standing, uh, praying, uh, who join the Jama late or or praying uh, sunnah, sunnah, as many people yeah. do, unfortunately. Uh -huh. yeah, somebody told me that you have to keep three raka or two raka. Is there any ruling on that? Uh, 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 sorry, is there any ruling on what? Uh, leaving? Well, keeping, the, keeping the distance while going outside from the mosque. If somebody is paying, mm -hmm. you have to go in front of him. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So how much distance we have to keep? Yeah. Clear. Okay, again, Abdul Aziz from Oman, he's back now. Okay, go on, Brother Abdul Aziz. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, I have one question. Yes, Yaqi, go on. Uh, regarding the lady, behalf uh, on my wife, she needs to cut his hair. So it is allowed to cut hair, but always, alhamdulillah, she is wearing hijab. But she needs to give shape, shape for that one. So, no idea for this one. Just put some light on this. Okay, no problem. Inshallah. Tayyib. Okay. Um, by the way, Tayyib means okay. But, uh, so don't worry about it. It's, it is not a very strange uh, word. It's good to get used to uh, some of those uh, terminologies that we use them as fillers. Um, we have the... Uh, uh, again, as we said, we have we had some questions from the previous episode. Uh, we have the question of uh, Brother Rami from Egypt. He said that he has spent most of his adulthood uh, not praying. He said uh, he started to pray about years ago. What can he do about all of these uh, prayers? Uh, Alhamdulillah, first of all, we should be thankful to Allah Jalla wa'ala that Allah Jalla wa'ala guided you, Brother Rami, and we should ask Allah Jalla wa'ala to guide all of us, all of our brothers and sisters. And in terms of the prayer that you have left, uh, we say that, as maybe most of yours know, that there are two opinions. One opinion say that you must compensate, you must make them up, all the prayers. And there is another opinion that uh, says you don't need to make them up. We say, because the first opinion is the opinion that has been adopted by the vast majority of scholars, we prefer that, uh, or it is difficult to go against the vast majority of scholars just uh, easily like this. And uh, for sure, they have understood all the evidence uh, behind uh, such opinion. And that's why we would uh, request that you pray as much as you can. So whenever you come to pray Asr, pray uh, another or uh, another amount of Nafil before Asr. Whenever you come to pray Dhuhr, pray another amount of Nafil before Dhuhr. Whenever you have time at night, pray as much Qiyamul Layl as you can. Whenever you come to pray Fajr, make sure that you pray the two Raka'ah uh, before Fajr. So that this opinion you can say combines between both opinions, the opinion of the vast majority of scholars, and we don't want to neglect it, and the second opinion, which says that it is not obligatory to make those prayers that you missed 
uh, it is not obligatory, obligatory to make them up. Um, we have another question from Brother Irfan from India. He said, should we shave our hair completely after performing uh, Umrah or just uh, trimming it? Um, as you know, my dear respected brothers and sisters, that it is sunnah for the male to shave his head after hajj or umrah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam made dua. He said, Allahumma ghfir lil muhalliqeen. Oh Allah, forgive for those who shave their heads completely. And he repeated this, Allahumma ghfir lil muhalliqeen, Allahumma ghfir lil muhalliqeen, means he made dua three times for those who shave their heads completely. And this hadith is general. It covers both hajj and umrah. And you know, in particular in hajj, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, uh, you will get one single hasana for every thread of hair that falls. Some scholars said, you might get even this amount of hasanat when you shave your head for umrah. However, it is allowed to trim it. Um, we have uh, another call from Brother Mahmoud from Oman. MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. Yes, go on, Brother Mahmoud. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you for uh, giving uh, guidance to the Muslim, Muslim Oman, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. I have one question about zakat, please. Yeah. Uh, Every year I pay zakat in the month of Ramadan. Mm -hmm. I would like to pay, I know there is some more amount will come, but I want to pay before uh, Ramadan, say Shaban or two months before. Is it allowed some amount? Why, do you, why do you want to pay that before? Because some uh, orphan children, they are studying in school, so we have to pay their fees. I don't understand why. What, what's the relationship between the fees that you need the, to pay? The orphan, the orphan, yatim, yatim. The yatim, yatim boy, orphan. Ah, okay, orphan, orphan, yatim. Okay, yatim. yatim. This is you so integrated he, between he Arabic and English. Paid his fees, so I want to help the zakat money for that. Ah, so you want to give the yatim, okay, the orphan. Uh, money before Ramadan. So there is a need to give uh, this zakah money before the due time. Yes, yes. Is okay. It is it, is it, it is clear, inshallah. We have also Maryam uh, from Jordan. Go ahead, uh, Sister Maryam. Yes, Sir. Alaikum. Alaikum, Sir. Yes, go uh, ahead, my sister. Question is this. Yeah, my question is this. Um, I'm here in Jordan, and my husband's in America, and I came here to um, let my kids learn Arabic. To sorry, you you came like, sorry you came to Jordan in order to in order to let my kids learn Arabic fluently. Okay. Yes, and anyways, my husband would like for us to return to America in the summer, at least to visit and to stay with him there because his work is there. And then we would come back in the fall to commence the new school year, inshallah. This is the plan. Inshallah. My question is this. Um, I feel that I follow the opinion that it's haram for a woman to travel without a mahram. Mm -hmm. And my husband agrees with the opinion, and the other opinion is that she can travel with a al mahram as long as it's in, within 24 hours and it's safe and it's whatever else that opinion says. Now, if he asks me to come back and he says, well... Okay, the line may be cut off, but uh, I think the question is clear. I got it. I got it. I got it. But uh, um, we had a similar, uh, a similar question uh, from Brother Islam. Alhamdulillah, that the uh, questioner, uh, his name is Islam or was Islam from Egypt. Uh, otherwise, we would have doubted that the brother is asking a question and the 
his wife is countering the question by another question, which is a politics between the husband and wife. And sometimes we get into this trap. Alhamdulillah, I think the situation is not like this, uh, but uh, we got the question, inshallah. Uh, okay, we have Nasruddin from Nigeria. Yes? Where we are putting our children and where we are not doing things here. Yes, brother. It seems that the line was cut off. Okay. Uh, let us deal with the uh, questions that we just received. Uh, we had the question of brother Islam from Egypt. And he said that oh, he had, uh, in fact, two questions. The first question was the wedding ring. Is it allowed to wear the wedding ring? Now, I'm sure, Brother Islam, that you have heard a number of p opinions regarding the wedding ring. And some people say that it is not allowed because it is something that has been imported from non-Islamic culture and it is unique. Not just imported from a non-Islamic culture, it is unique and it can be seen as a symbol for non-Muslims. Uh, and it is also related to Aqeedah. They say that um, the Trinity believes, okay, as we know that Allah uh, and the Spirit and Jesus, and hence they feel that we should put the ring uh, here in this finger to represent that Aqeedah. What I say that if wearing a wedding ring is in a culture that this Aqeedah or this belief is not known and people will not suspect that you are wearing it because of this. And this is totally not there. And moreover, it did not become a symbol for uh, non-Muslims. Then it is allowed to wear it. Okay. However, if uh, there is no need to wear it, uh, maybe it's better to be on the safe side. But I don't think with those conditions that I mentioned to you, uh, that it will be uh, prohibited. Uh, we have uh, another phone call. Um Ihan from Bahrain. Yes, go on, yeah, sister. Assalamu alaikum. Wa rahmatullah. Uh, I have just uh, one question. Yes, go on, this sister. Is, uh, why does Allah sometimes in the Quran refer to himself in the first person, like I am closer to you than your jugla veil, and in other places in the third person, like like that. Uh -huh. So in, in, in certain places in the Quran, Allah Jalla wa speak, speaks about himself using the word I or we. And sometimes he would speak about himself uh, by using the third person language. Yeah? Or terminology. Huwa. Huwa Allahu alladhi la ilaha illa huwa. Okay. Uh, we'll have a short break now, inshallah, and inshallah we will resume uh, dealing with uh, your questions after the break. Stay with us, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. Dear viewers, Hoda programs can be watched in the English section of the in-flight entertainment directory on board all Saudi airline flights, domestic and international. Sit back, relax and enjoy watching Hoda's entertaining and enlightening shows on your trip. Hoda wishes you a safe and successful journey. Hoda, a light in every home. Oh. Europe's forgotten heritage. This is a sad reminder of the past history of the Muslims in the city. Nowadays, there are no Muslims anymore. These are the mosques that have remained. And it is really sad. Wait a second, this is Morocco. No, this is Tunisia, Algeria, North Africa, Egypt. No, this is all Europe. And this is all part of Spain. Islam spread first in Africa and then from Africa it came over to Europe and then it did developing work in Europe. Now, we look the other way around nowadays. The compass was invented by the Muslims. Many important 
um, um, inventions came from the time of the Muslims on the Iberian Peninsula. Instead of people becoming less in battles, as we normally know, as we, we know in battles obviously people die, but no, what was happening? The Spaniards recognized and realized the superiority of the Muslims and the treatment that the Muslims gave to the Christians and the Jews in Spain at that time, that they happily accepted Islam, many of them. And not over the fountain, as we've seen it before in other places in Greece. Now, it has some Arabic on top, as well as it has some Arabic down where the tap used to be, or where the water was coming out. Pack your bags, grab your passports, and join Dr. Stef Keris as he takes us through Europe and rediscovers Europe's forgotten heritage, only on Hoda TV. Welcome back, brothers and sisters. Uh, I would like to put the um, telephone call again in front of you, but uh, we have so many questions, and that's why uh, maybe let us deal with the questions first, and then if we have more time, inshallah, we will receive more calls. But you are free to uh, send emails to ask at Huda. Dot TV. Um, we were dealing with the questions of Brother Islam from Egypt, and uh, he had the first question about wearing a wedding ring. The, his second question was, uh, are women allowed to travel without a mahram? And he gave the example, traveling from Egypt to America. Again, my dear respected brothers and sisters, I am sure that all of you have heard answers about this question. And I am sure that every single one of you have access to yeah, an uh, internet and he can search online so many answers about this uh, question. Now, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wa Sahbihi Wa Sallam said, La tusafiru al-mar'ah ma'a uh, لا تسافر المرأة مسيرة يوم وليلة أو مسيرة ثلاثة أيام إلا مع ذي محرم that a woman is not allowed to travel either a journey of one day and night or a journey of three nights without a mahram. Now the Prophet وسلم, gave us a clear instruction that she should not travel except with a mahram. This is the clear statement of the Prophet وسلم. The other point is here Masirata yawmin wa layla, a distance of one day and night. Some scholars say that whenever you consider this distance or this time as a safar, a journey classified as a safar, then the ruling applies. So don't say that this journey, uh, the length of this journey is not one day and night. Otherwise, these days, if even if you travel from America, to uh, China, uh, it will not be considered as a safar because you can cut that maybe journey in 18 hours or so. So these days we will not have uh, a safar. No. Uh, as we said that the scholars have two opinions regarding uh, what is considered to be safar. Uh, or you can say three opinions. One opinion uh, depends on the time. Another opinion depends on the distance and another opinion uh, that says whatever is considered to be a safar according to the custom of people is classified as a safar from a sharia, from the sharia perspective. And as we said, the Prophet sallallahu is the one who gave us this instruction. So why do we want to violate the law of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam? No, you should not do it, my dear respected brothers and sisters. And we know of so many stories of sisters who traveled without a mahram and they fell into troubles. Moreover, my dear respected brothers and sisters, some people say that if there is security and there is no fear uh, against the sister traveling without a mahram, then the ruling is not applied. I would like to say to you one important point. Who said that the Prophet 
made the reason behind the prohibition of traveling without a mahram security. It is an opinion that has been mentioned by a scholar and it doesn't mean that it is an opinion that has been endorsed by all scholars or the vast majority of scholars. In fiqh, we find opinions about everything because fiqh is so rich and some of the opinions are considered to be odd opinions. So the illah, the uh, foundation of the hukum, of the ruling of prohibition without a mahram is not the sense of security, is not the issue of fear uh, for the sister traveling. There are a number of other elements, for example, when sisters travel without mahram, they feel more independent from their uh, either husbands or families. And this is known. Moreover, the men themselves, they will not feel the responsibility that Allah Jalla wa Ala put upon them towards their families. And whenever they find it easy to say to for example, the, the brother to say his, to his sister or to his wife, go travel by yourself, they will do it. So they will not have that responsibility. And this responsibility is an Islamic responsibility. And there are a number of other possible wisdoms behind the prohibition of, uh, of sisters traveling without mahram. That's why we say, let us stick to Sharia and all success lies with uh, lies in following sharia full stop um, his uh, second third question brother islam from egypt he said is it obligatory upon the lady to serve her husband or to do the housework including cooking including other things now I am sure, again, that you have heard a number of opinions regarding this, and I'm sure that you have heard that opinion that says that women are not obliged to serve their husbands, and they are not obliged even to uh, carry the normal housework. And we say that those scholars who mentioned this, they mentioned it, they mentioned it in a certain context, in a certain space, in a certain time. And that opinion is confronted by another opinion that says no she must do what the custom uh, is used to uh, is used to so if by custom women in that custom are obliged from an ethical perspective or a customary perspective to serve their husbands and to do the housework then she must follow that custom there is no specific direct textual delil that confirms that she must do it or she must not do it. But the scholar said that uh, uh, the, the husband is responsible to maintain and provide for his wife. And they said that his wife, his wife's time is allocated for the husband. This is what the fuqaha said. That's why they said that she is not allowed to go outside without the permission of her husband. So if that is the case, then can you tell me if uh, she is going to stay at home, what is she going to do at home? This is one thing. The other thing, my dear respect to the brothers and sisters, what is the meaning of وَآشِرُوهُنَّ بالمعروف? What is the meaning of وَعَاشِرُوهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ? Deal with them with ma'roof, with goodness, in goodness. What is the meaning of matrimonial life? Do we stop at the technical points what the fuqaha or some scholars mentioned and we forget about the spirit of matrimonial life and marriage? How can be uh, a marriage successful if there is no affection between both sides if no if the man does not complement what the woman uh, does if the wife does not complement what her husband uh, does then there will be no life another important point now if the husband is not rich enough to uh, hire a servant or to have uh, a house made in order to work to cook to clean 
or to look after the children, who is going to do this? This is, I think, inshallah, this would be enough. We have a question from uh, Sister Aisha. She said that uh, uh, she know of a friend who is uh, five weeks pregnant and she might need to abort the pregnancy in order to carry an operation. This is what I got from the uh, question. Uh, I know you might uh, say that you did not get the full question, but the questions related to abortion, I would like you to go and discuss them with a scholar face to face. I don't like to uh, address questions regarding abortion in front of the public. Each case is different. The general ruling is abortion is not something that Islam is in favor of. Islam is not in favor of abortion in, mo in all cases, generally speaking. And some scholars prohibited abortion even if the fetus less than four weeks or even if the fetus is less than 40 days. So that's why even if we were to say that in this case it is allowed to have abortion, I wouldn't like to say this in front of the public. Each case should be dealt according to its own merit. And I ask you, sister, to go and to discuss it with a scholar whom you trust, inshallah. Okay, we have the question of Brother Farhan from UAE. And he said that his friend was looking for a job for some time and he did not find a job, I think, for two years, he said. And then recently he had an offer from a bank in uh, a conventional bank in uh, Pakistan. Is he allowed to join that bank to work for that job? Generally speaking, my dear respected brothers and sisters, it is not allowed to work for a conventional bank that is based on riba. Why is this? You know the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu I'm sure all of you know the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu where he, what he cursed. Those who consume riba, those who give riba, those who witness the contract of riba, means facilitate the contract of riba. And those who write the contract of riba, this is another way of facilitating the contract of riba, which means that Riba is a very grave sin that we should not be involved in facilitating it by all means. Now, and you know the ayat that talk about the prohibition of riba. الذين يقومون الذين يأكلون الربا لا يقومون إلا كما يقوم الذي يتخبطه الشيطان من المس and uh, all the other ayat. And uh, so. Uh, working for any institution that promotes riba and that is based mainly on riba is not allowed. And there is no baraka in the money that comes from that institution. Uh, I have a very limited time, otherwise I could have narrated so many stories of those who used to work for conventional banks and they had no baraka in their money and eventually they preferred to leave the bank that gives them a good salary for another job that gives them a small salary because of the issue of baraka. So I don't advise the brother to join the bank at all. However, let me be uh, more clear. Some conventional banks, they are called conventional banks, but they do not uh, deal with riba in most of their transactions. They deal uh, in riba with some of their transactions. Uh, very little compared to the volume of the bank. Let us say around 20%, 25% only. And the rest of it is just uh, permissible transactions. If that is the case, if that is the case, we say that you can work for those departments that do not promote riba and that do not deal with riba directly or do not promote riba indirectly. Okay, let us be practical because in uh, some countries uh, people 
uh, who, especially those who are specialized in IT, in accountancy, in some other professions, they might not find uh, jobs except in uh, such institutional uh, uh, frames. Uh, or in, 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 uh, except in such uh, financial institutions. So in this case, what shall they do? We say that if you do not find, like the case of the brother Farhan or, or his friend, if you do not find a job and you have been looking for a job for years, as the brother said, then go for a job that does not promote riba and that does not deal with riba even if it is in a conventional bank provided and this is the second condition that the conventional bank is not based mainly on riba means they have some riba transactions 10 percent 15 percent 20 uh, 20 25 yeah maximum one fourth of their of their transactions are based on riba and we always say that fear Allah as much as you can. This is the very golden principle. And we also remind our brothers and sisters that من ترك شيئا لله عوضه الله خيرا من ومن يتق الله يجعل له مخرجا The one who fears Allah جل وعلا Allah جل وعلا will find a way for him or for her. Uh, the question of brother Ridwan again from UAE he said that uh, is it uh, a must to fold the trouser during the salah and we say that first of all wearing clothes that are dragging uh, should be avoided my dear respected brother and my dear respected brothers in general you know that the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam said la yanzuru allah ila man jarra Allah Jalla does not look at the person who is dragging his clothes out of pride. In the other hadith, the Prophet وسلم, said three people that Allah Jalla does not look at them, and one of them is Al Musbil, the one who is dragging his clothes. I know that whenever we address this question, people will say, but that scholar said, dragging clothes. Uh, without pride is allowed so let us drag them we say brothers we have to put ourselves in the safe side and there is no need to drag our clothes even the trousers don't say that they look odd uh, inshallah they can be decent so avoid that generally speaking and in particular during salah but don't make it as a sunnah that you don't do it outside salah and you just come to salah and you do it and people think that it is sunnah. Um, I think uh, the director is telling me that we are about to finish the episode. How many minutes or are we finishing now? Are we finishing now? Okay, I think we are finishing. But we will see you inshallah. My dear respected brothers and sisters in the uh, coming episode. Jazakumullahu khaira. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Allah is my heart's speech. Your mercy is what I beseech. Keep in my heart your remembrance and you.